interesting, uh, fascinating subject. I don't know anything about uh, this topic, but I'm really uh, excited to hear about it. So first we've got Dr. Philip Johnson, who is uh, the head of uh, our engineering department, and the professor of mechanical engineering. Uh, and then we've got uh, Mr. Bob Lake, who's the founder of the college. But I think Philip's going to come up first. And there he is. The title of the talk is Maximizing Growth from Business to Education, A New Approach from Physics. So please join me in welcoming you. Thank you, Peter. So the motto here at Thales College, if you want to read right below here on the podium, is scientia et sapientia. So there's knowledge and wisdom. And tonight we'll get a little bit of both. You can already see the busyness on this first slide. The idea of this talk is going to be we're going to have this grand theme about motion, about what drives motion. It'll wax philosophically. If you get felt, feel it's a little esoteric, hang in there. It'll get to some physics, which is actually easier than the esoteric part. And then we'll get to some practical elements. So if you find yourself wondering, it will all, all be illuminating in the end. So with that kind of integrated idea that we want to promulgate here, I do want to start with this. We'll start with philosophy. In some sense, that is the source of, of all of our ways of thinking. One of the first philosophers to give us a robust account of motion that we at least still have today is Plato. And he recorded this dialogue, the Timaeus. It is, interestingly enough, perhaps his most influential work, arguably more so than the Republic or some other well-known dialogues. And it is account of creation. So it's a 20, 23 century old sort of story that he tells. And I'm referring to it as a myth, not as a fabrication in a false sense of the idea, but as a foundation story. It's meant to kind of be a deep level understanding of how the world was made and why it is as it is. Within this story, he tells this idea of God, or the good, or the one, the highest being. He refers to as a benevolent father who asks the highest of all creatures, this godlike figure called the Demiurge, which is it's a Greek word for craftsman, someone who kind of shapes things, does things with their hands. And he requests of this demiurge to fashion the cosmos by looking at an intelligible pattern of beauty and order. And so as this story unfolds, this demiurge looks at this pattern and then looks at this unshaped matter and tries to shape it, tries to craft it. And that's how we get the world before us. And there's a benevolence to it. There's an attempt to make the world as beautiful as possible. Later commentators on this text will make use of three ideas of mind, soul, and matter. So mind ends up being collapsed in this idea of being the mind of the demiurge as that intelligible pattern. So the demiurge is actually using his own wisdom to fashion and shape the world through the idea of soul. The Greek word for soul being psyche, it's similar to a type of breath, similar to pneuma, if you would know that. And within that kind of fluid, we have flow. So this idea from mind, from wisdom, comes flow. And when that is applied to matter, it shapes it. And it makes goodness and order. All right, then. Hence, hence the esoteric part. So what I want to show you in the following portions of this talk is that that analogy, that story, is helpful to understand some contemporary advances in physics and both of those will be useful to all of our understandings and our various enterprises and is directly applicable um, even to the everyday business person. So how do we get from there, from there to here? So I'm going to give you two millennia of physics in two minutes. Plato had a rogue student uh, named Aristotle. You may have heard of him as well. And he used some Platonizing ideas and kind of developed his own thought process in it. So two, two kind of key couplets theme-wise for him are form and matter. Form is also a type of information. It's an idea. It's a shape. Um, and that configuration shapes the matter, and it makes something good and noble with it. So one of the examples that he loves to utilize is that there is a form of a tree and the seed. There is an idea behind it. There's an intelligence of a kind of seed already latent um, of a tree, excuse me, latent in the seed, and that actually causes the motion. So the form of the tree and the seed causes the motion of the seed towards the tree. And so there's an end or purpose that it's trying to achieve. It's trying to reach that form. So within that, he also has some other ideas about motion. People will begin to commentate on it. There are some critiques of the way he understands some things, such as projectile motion. Some, some of the commentators developed the important idea of impetus. So it's kind of a precursor to what we would call inertia. 
That, those concepts will then get grafted into what we commonly understand if anyone's taken a physics or a physical science course, the mechanical system that is Newton, the Newtonian system where we talk about force and matter and motion and the kind of contemporary language that we will understand and how I'll be using in the talk for the rest of the night. As the mechanical system begins to develop, we also observe various other phenomena undergoing motion. But they're all kind of in disparate fields. So this is when, in the 1700s, Benjamin Franklin is operating. Uh, he, you know, this is the classic, I'm playing with a kite in a lightning storm. Well, how is electricity flowing? At the same time, people will be asking questions about what actually is heat? Why does a cannon get really hot when a cannonball goes through it? And they're working kind of in disparate fields. Thermodynamics is one of the first attempts to unify these. So the two main ideas in thermodynamics, we're now in the mid-1800s or so, is that all of these things have a quantity called energy. And that energy is always conserved through all these processes. But, secondly, energy disperses. So to demystify entropy, just understand the second law of thermodynamics is that energy goes everywhere. So again, we have, we have something that flows. In the, in the last century, we have a couple Nobel Prize winners, a man named Lars Onsager, who did some work in the 1930s, and he began to unify some of these things like electricity and heat and pressure, and to give them a grand unified theory that we'll hear relay in a moment. In between him and today, another Nobel Prize winner, Ilya Prigozhin, he begins to ask questions about the gradients of pressure. So if they have a high pressure and a low pressure, or a high temperature and low temperature, there is a flow. But if I really kind of push on those uh, discrepancies and I have a very high difference between those, what kind of new modes of transport would arise in those systems? So then finally within this tradition, uh, we have a contemporary, uh, we, we call him a physicist, but he's actually a professor of mechanical engineering at Duke University. Uh, and a, and a, some, something of a, an acquaintance or friend of some of those affiliated with the college and whose name will be evoked a few times tonight, especially in the second talk we're giving, Adrian Bijan. And he is working in this idea of all this transport of pressure and temperature causing flow. And he has this idea that systems want to increase the way that they can do, that they can put, transmit flow. They want to increase flow axis. So let's unpack some of these concepts from uh, those more modern advances. So the first concept is that force drives flow. Now, we can talk about force in a Newtonian sense. We can just write this variable f like I, I kicked a soccer ball. But there's a, there's a more abstract understanding of force that it's any time you have a gradient in energy. So the way I want to explain this, if you look on the right of this slide, we have um, three different cases, and these are going to move sequentially in time. In the upper right, we have three chambers, and they each have different pressures within them. And the chambers are separated by some barrier. That we've, that we've placed there to prevent any motion in between them. So the symbol that I have, the font size, should be reflective of the strength of the pressure. So the chamber on the far left is the highest pressure, and the chamber on the far right is the lowest pressure. So what happens when those barriers are removed? We have flow, and that flow is caused by the pressure difference, and flow moves from high to low. So the nature of hierarchy, we could say there's an energy hierarchy here, and that difference, that inequality, is actually what drives the motion of systems. And this is true abstractly, not just for pressure, but for temperature. In fact, when we talk about voltage driving a current, voltage is an electrical potential difference. So anytime you have those gradients, you're going to get flow. The flow, as it moves, it actually depletes the force. So as you move through these sequences, in the middle we have the flow, and as you can begin to see, the font sizes begin to equilibrate. So that on the bottom, all of those P letters should be the same size. Because the high pressure has been exhausted by sending that flow. So the final stage of a system is called thermodynamic equilibrium. And it's called equilibrium, and it's related to the word equality, because all of those force drivers are equal. And when you have equality in a physical system, you don't have motion. So equilibrium is a kind of death of a system, at least motive-wise. So key ideas, energy hierarchy causes flow, and then flow depletes that hierarchy or force. Second main idea is that within those flow systems, the way you kind of configure your channel or whatever you're moving through will affect the speed at which the flow goes. So we kind of intuitively know this because we talk about resistance in an, every, in an everyday understanding. And I do actually have something of a prop to explain this. So, if I, had, if I had a piece of PVC pipe, 
and I had water running through it. I had a high pressure on this side and a low pressure on this side. Water would go that way. If I had a wider piece, it would be easier to push the water through a wider pipe. So the larger the area you have, the lower the resistance you have, or conversely, the higher conductivity you have. It's easier to push things through big channels. And you can think, think of some of the traffic you may experience here tonight. You get a small two-lane road and a bunch of cars back up, sometimes even big highways back up. But the idea of designing large highways is to facilitate flow. You can even put them together and you can start to bottleneck things. So I don't know if everyone can see the difference in the back, but if I go from a thick to a thin sort of tube, I'm going to start increasing the resistivity and it's gonna be harder to push flow through this second section. So there's a length component, there's an area component. Now, where this gets really interesting is how we can begin to combine sections. So what I am showing here, before we get to the branch component, if you look at the middle figure, I, in order to understand the resistance, the flow resistance of how hard I have to push flow through this entire system, I have to account for this resistance and add it to that one. But when you create a branch, a branching system, you actually get to add not the resistances, but the conductance. So the question that we might ask is that if I had, let's say, something like this, and I wanted to flow water through this system, it only has one way to go, if I add a second branch, I now have two pathways, and it is going to be much easier to flow out of this dual channel than it would be through a single channel. So nature is going to prefer branching because that makes things easier to flow, and nature wants things to be easier to flow. The cost, of course, to this is that if I go back and have this prop, I actually had to pay for this. Uh, Home Depot did not give me this second portion for free. I have to, it charges me for every inch of PVC that I buy. And so there is a cost to get that second flow component. But nonetheless, it is often worth it. And this is why we see trees everywhere in nature, not just in literal trees, but we see branch networks that look like trees in river basins. We see them in our lungs. We see them in capillary systems. And as you'll see here in a moment, you see them in business systems, effective business systems. There's a reason why nature loves trees. And this is the key concept that Adrian Bajan is, is known for. And it's kind of summarized in this quote. In order for a system to live or persist in time, it must evolve in a way that increases its flow access. So effectively what that means is it wants to increase that conductivity and make things easier to flow. And we know that since branches make things easier to flow, the consequence is that systems that, that thrive are those that make branches. So let's see this on two different time scales. So on the upper right of this slide, we have a time lapse of a tree growing. And what's happening in this is that the tree uses leaves to receive light. It wants to receive all this electromagnetic radiation because it utilizes it for different chemical reactions. So it, what it's trying to do is increase its surface area so we can soak up as much sunlight as it can. And it is actually growing towards an ever more branching system. So not only is it branching out when it adds those leaves, the leaves themselves are branching. You can kind of see those different branches on an individual leaf, but then it creates another segment and that itself is a branch. So there's all kind of layers of branches. Um, it would be harder to do a time-lapse of the root system, but you would see a similar feature because the root system is trying to find all of these different water sources and bring them from multiple sources into one and facilitate that flow. On a very different time scale, if we look at a slow motion, a very slowed down slow motion uh, occurrence of a lightning storm, we would also see branch systems forming. So what happens in this is that there is a force driver, there is an electropotential difference, so there's, there's all this electricity, we would come and say there's all this electricity in the clouds and it wants to find the ground. And how does it do this? Well, it creates little electric trees. And that's what you see forming. And as it's creating these trees, it is searching what is the fastest way to the ground. And the, the fastest way to find the fastest way to the ground is to search all of these different routes. And all of those little branches that it's finding is it's thinking temporarily, and I'm attributing, attributing things to nature, it's thinking temporarily that maybe this way is faster and that way is faster until finally it finds the fastest conduit and that's when you have the flash that we normally see. This is at, I don't know, many tens of thousands of frames per second, which is why we only see that one stroke. But the, the process 
is a branching process. Is there a purpose to what nature is doing? This is perhaps the, the most controversial point to attribute a purpose to nature. We've known for some time from advances in physics this idea of what we would commonly say the path of least resistance um, or the principle of least action, if you want to speak in the language of physics. So here's an image of Richard Feynman, famous physicist, Nobel Lord himself. And to the left of his hand, you can, excuse me, I should say the right, so I'm, I'm in his position. So to where you're looking at, to the right of his hand on that screen, you see a kind of curvature on the, on the board. And it's a parabolic type of shape. What he is actually doing is he is tracing out a path between two points. And if you look hard enough, you can notice some fainter sort of squiggles that he has written in. And what he has shown is that nature has sought to look over all of these different pathways, even the, the kind of light squiggles that he's drawn. But once it finds that most expedient pathway, it takes it. And we can explain most motion, if not all of it, through this sort of uh, abstract formalism of finding this path of least resistance. This applies not just to inanimate systems about forces and pressure. We can start applying this to animal and human systems, living systems and sociological things. So here is an image from, you probably weren't expecting to hear anything about a video game tonight. This is Sid Meier's Civilization. I have not played this game, but I somehow heard that it is one of the most popular or highest rated games of all time. Why I'm interested in it academically is that it is a good game purportedly because of the way that it models human civilization. So the way these games work out is you start with a different tribe of a few people and these people go and hunt and gather resources and then they build houses, the population grows, then they build military buildings, military weapons, increases technology and it kind of compounds. So you simulate human civilization from this sort of primitive state into an advanced state. And then there are other players also doing it and they fight, okay, popular game. The interesting thing is that he built a fantastic model by utilizing these same sort of concepts. So this is called the 4X theory. It's actually four E words, but it's, they're EX words. So they are explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. And the way this works, at least conceptually on a high level, is that all of these players are wanting to explore their surroundings. They want to find resources. They want to, once they find good resource pockets, they want to expand and create a conduit for flow so that resources can come to their little home center. They want to exploit that. So once you've kind of expanded different areas and you find the maximal place for flow, you exploit that and allocate resources. Say, I want to go and exploit this pathway and harvest all of this energy or, or what have you, material. And then the last stage is exterminate. So you become so effective at doing this, you can do this better than the other players, and you basically siphon off their chances to gather resources, and you're the last player remaining. I would argue that this is such a fantastic model because this is what's happened in history. So you can read the understanding and the history of nations and empires through this lens of the wanting to go out and find different places of resources and material, or unfortunately human labor at times, and they want to exploit that and increase. Now, we can have a debate about the uh, nobility or, or ignoble nature of these various empires. Some of them have done better than others at this, and they have caused noble flows. But nonetheless, there is a consistent model in all of these empires in the way that they branch out and find these resources. Another example of this, we can look through trade. So we can, we can see money as a type of entity that flows through systems. Here on the left, we have an, a map of the Roman Empire and late antiquity with all of its various trade nodes. And as you can see, there is lots of flow across the Mediterranean Sea, lots of, lots of ship voyages. This is why you hear stories of Paul in the New Testament going to all these various cities on the coastline and traveling in ships because there's all these pathways uh, that have been established because of the purported stability of the empire. As the empire would eventually shrink down um, and various successor states arise, there's a retreat of trade, a retreat of inflow of money, and so society retreats to a type of feudal, agrarian system. Because there is not a sustained flow of trade, uh, there's less com commerce. And so we characterize the Middle Ages, and this is on the right now, this figure would show less trade work networks, and in fact, some of them are, are cut off from each other. So you, it's not put on here, but there's various Christian states in Europe and Anatolia, and then there's various Islamic states in North Africa and the Levant. And there's almost two different trade systems. 
And because of the lack of trade between them, there's just less flow overall. And so people are farming. People are not um, spending time at the bank and, and trade. There's some trade, but it's lessened compared to earlier times. And in fact, we can understand the rise of modernity through the fact that our, these stable um, states had increased their agrarian wealth so much that they could actually set, buy and sell things in the market to facilitate trade again, and trade networks will arise. And that's the hallmark of modernity, which is why we think about um, banks uh, in the Netherlands and in Switzerland um, and, and what have you. So we can understand money as a type of flow. So in sum, before we get to some of these direct applications of money flow, I wanted to just touch base again, and perhaps some of our story is clear from that earlier myth, that there is a causal hierarchy, that it's either energy or money or ideas that's causing flow. Flow has to occur in different types of channels. There are some channels that facilitate faster and slower flow. These channels can change over time. So this is a concept we didn't touch on as much before, but over here I'm showing how a river network will form over time. And what happens, it's not just that those flow networks can be static. Because nature wants there to be a faster way to flow, river channels develop because it removes sediment. So if I have all this resistivity that I'm having to brush up against, over time, erosion will take away that sediment and it will widen the channel and make it easier to flow. So the flow channels themselves will evolve. And if you're in, a, in an environment where there's different flow channels competing for the same flow, well, they have to improve. Each system has to improve because its competitor is going to. Otherwise, all of its flow is going to get siphoned off somewhere else. And so the last kind of practical point is that nature uh, rewards systems that have freedom to evolve and change their configurations. Because freedom allows this reconfiguration and it allows more flow in it. We'll touch on some of these more um, in the second part of the talk, but I want to give a few high-level business examples before we transition. So if we look at the, the case of manufacturing, um, here we have a unit that was developed and is produced uh, through captive air systems. Um, this is uh, our rooftop unit, um, DOAS, and what's, there's uh, several components of what's, uh, uh, what's happening on this slide. The one that I want you to focus on is right in the dead center. You may see uh, some kind of bright orange-colored copper uh, you can kind of see, it looks like little, little pieces of it. What those actually are are bins that have been inserted into the aluminum. So this is a heat exchanger as part of that unit. And I won't go into all the physics about why it's designed this way, but there are some standard ways of putting this copper into that unit. And I want to show how this flow system sort of process can be applied to manufacturing. So let's say there's three processes to get those copper tubes in there. Let's say you have a big, huge, and, and perhaps some of you can see this someday. We can go take a visit to one of these plants. But you have a big winding coil of copper. And so we have to pull that copper out of the coil. It needs to be a certain length, depending on the design of that heat exchanger. It'll be cut by a machine. And sometimes a straight piece will be sent over. And sometimes it will be folded back over. And that's how you get those U-bends. And we, between straight pieces and U-bends, they're normally sent somewhere. And they're kind of either by hand or by, by machine, placed into that aluminum. Now, in order to get it in the aluminum, there needs to be a gap in the holes of the aluminum that you actually insert the tubes into. But those gaps are really bad for heat transfer, so you want them to be flush. So you take a machine, and you expand those copper tubes to be tight against the aluminum. And then finally, you may have to seam up the connections through a process called brazing. Think about it as welding, but with a chemical additive. All of these processes take time. Some of them take more time than others. And let's say, hypothetically, that that tube expansion process is the slowest process in the entire system. We now have what's called a bottleneck. So if anybody has is, is looked into manufacturing and read the book The Goal, this is the idea of the theory of constraints, that if you want to facilitate increased flow in your manufacturing process, you attack the bottlenecks. So if I allocated resources to making the tube bending part faster, that would make no sense. That's not what's slowing me down. What's slowing me down is the expansion process. So how do we mitigate that? Well, one way, probably if you're running your existing machine at max capacity, you raise some capital to buy a second machine. And so what's happened now is that I can send all of the cut and bent tubes to two different machines that can expand. And I've increased that flow axis of that region. And so there's more flow moving through that middle portion now. But notice what we did. We created a new branch. 
We could also take this sort of mentality into an abstract uh, understanding of ideas themselves. We could look at intellectual history and say that ideas are promulgated through history. So um, there's this idea called meme theory that effectively says that what makes humans so superior is not that we are, we are latently intelligent. We are greatly intelligent beings. But what makes us so powerful is that we have a way of transmitting our predecessors' information. We, we don't have to relearn um, how to do things. We don't have to literally reinvent the wheel. We can just take the last guy's wheel and all of their creative energy that they put into a final product, we can just kind of get that final product. And then we can expend our creative energy on making something new. And in fact, that's another way to understand innovation. Is every time you innovate, you're branching off of an existing system. So one way to interpret the history of Western science uh, that I alluded to in that one of the earlier slides is that over time, people commentating on Aristotle said so many things that it was so confusing and so hard to wade through that that pathway for scientific advancement became restrictive. And so an innovator comes along to make a new branch. And that's often how we pitch Galileo and Newton is that all this restriction, I'm going to go my own way and do my own thing. Now, I have my own comments about this narrative. Galileo himself is working as a part of the tradition, so it's not as radical as we would characterize it. But nonetheless, each of these thinkers, even the commentators on Aristotle from the medieval period, they are all stepping out of their lane and trying something new to see if we can get the flow of science to move faster. And this doesn't just have to be with academic science. This could be technological innovation or some type of catchy sales idea. All of these sort of moments, you're stepping out on your own to create a new branch. We can further think about workflow, responsibilities that we are engaging in. So let's say that we are, I or, or you as an aspiring entrepreneur, and uh, some people start companies out of their garage, and they do uh, all of the work themselves. They deal with the administrative part, they deal with the technical part, and eventually if they're successful, their business has so much flow going through that they can't keep up. And so they hire employees. And now the employees are taking over some of the administrative and the technical, perhaps, while they're thinking at more high level, they're raising capital, doing, doing other things, et cetera. So we've already created a branch network. But we would, again, if we were successful, run into the same issue. So once the kind of business flow is moving very, very quickly, there are four options that we can operate at. So we can operate our business at, in a kind of restricted flow position, which means that we're losing profit. Because we could be making more sales than we could, but we, we cannot keep up with the demand. That's not a good state to be in because you want to be growing at all times. The second case is that we could try to widen the flow capacity. So either our workers become more efficient, they learn something new, or they just work a lot. Um, that may not be good in the long term for someone that wants to live a full human life and have work-life balance. Some people really love their job, but they like to eat dinner outside of the office. So eventually you max out the individual's flow capacity. So what's the next option? Well, we could replace the channel section. So what this means in business is you find someone that works better. But your business has been growing, and you've gotten to know these people, and they've helped you grow your business, and you don't want to reward them by replacing them. So let's say you want to keep them. What is the last option that you can take? Well, you can make more branches. So if you have the existing cash flow available so that you can hire more people, you continue to branch the system. And so now you have an organization that looks like modern organizations. You have an executive, you have management, and you have various laborers. And it should continue to grow and compound. This is how you see growing businesses work. You branch off, you delegate tasks, and you split them up. All right, so last, last branching example. So then finally, let's say you are so successful that you now have some capital to allocate or reallocate, or perhaps you, you were um, fortunate enough uh, to have cal capital to begin with. Where do you put it? So in all of these cases that I've cited, remember, we're thinking about what is the force that's driving this flow? What is the force that's driving the manufacturing flow? What is the force that's driving the intellectual flow? So this is what, is what is driving a business flow, and it's capital. You kind of need a force driver put up front to be able to create facilities, to be able to pay employees to get the business operating. You need a force for flow. So where do you put that, though? So another interesting feature of physics is we know that flow will go anywhere that it can. So if there is ever a channel to deplete that force, the force will become depleted. So the question is, do I create another channel with another business enterprise if it's not going to make as much money as my existing one? 
And this was a question that I was privy to listening in on. I was too low on the totem pole to give a comment about it. But one of my supervisors was talking about the state of the company and was asking, you know, they, the question was, do we keep all of our capital allocated in a business that is profitable, but not that profitable? And at the time, it seemed absurd to me, well, of course, it's, it's profitable. Why would you not keep it open and just use the profits towards things? Well, if, you do not, if you're not efficient with your cash flow, um, you could be growing at a faster rate. And your competitor may say that. And your competitor may go at a faster rate. And so in the business competition world, you need to constantly be thinking of how do I allocate this so that I can get the cash flow moving in as fast as possible manner. So you actually take the most efficient route where possible. There are humane and ethical considerations um, when considering something as heavy as a plant. But in the long run, um, efficiency is going to perpetuate the survival of the business as a whole. So then, forces a gradient and drives flow. And when flow occurs, the path of least resistance will be found. And we showed it in various cases, cases from physics to business, at least at the high level. We'll be very practical here in a moment. But was the myth true? So I tend to think that it is. I hope that it's more enlightening now to kind of see this wisdom moving in and shaping matter. I would also call attention to the account in the book of Genesis. So in that, we have Elohim providing this matter and then shaping and informing it. So the earth was, was void and without form. And that hovering of the Spirit shapes the world. And again, we have this sort of high, high top-down order that's shaping and giving goodness to things. At the end of that story, we are told that humanity are the representations. They are the images of this divine creator. And so what does that mean? There's been lots of thoughts given about what it means to be an image of this creator God. Many have postulated it has something to do with our rationality. I find a particular interpretation interesting from a figure, St. Ephraim the Syrian, uh, writing in the 5th century. He actually says that the image is that we, have to, we take dominion over things. So we create things. We shape things. And I think there's room to even merge these two interpretations and to say, that we are able to shape the world and create it because of that wisdom, because of that rationality. So the final point that I want to bring your attention to is to say that all of you are shaping the world in some way. Through your everyday decisions, we are all creating form and bringing order to the world. Some of us do it better than others, and that is why it is critical in our decision-making that we find these efficacious flows and we exercise wisdom to let it be the force driver to bring about this good change. So the next part of our talk is for someone that I think has done this well. Uh, Bob Luddy is the president of Captive Air and the founder of many school systems, including Thales Academy and our own Thales College. And so I'll now turn it over to him so he can show some specific examples about such flows. Thank you very much, Bill. <laughs> Thanks for making uh, physics interesting and also relevant. And one of the themes that we're, we're trying to get across, and this would come all the way through uh, primary, secondary school and college, that if you understand certain concepts that you may miss or may not be emphasized, because for some people, if you say in the ninth grade you want to take physics, they're going to go, please, no, and, and so on. But if you use a uh, physics apply to life, as you've just explained, you're going to be a superior decision maker because you're going to be working from very sound laws of physics that are unchanging. So that's kind of the, the theme that we're developing, and it's going to include at some point all students at Thales Academy in college. I like that too, Ever. Um, <clears throat> oh, I now we're talking. <laughs> uh, so here, here's some concepts coming out of the constructual law. Uh, laws of diminishing returns. So we use that in product development. When do we stop putting any more R&D into a particular product? Um, one of the things that Big John said when we brought it up to him is says, well, you recognize the law of diminishing returns, and maybe at a later date, uh, new inputs will allow you to review that decision. But where you're at today, you've reached the law of diminishing returns. So if you put more effort into it, you get no return. So we think of the uh, diminishing returns all the time. 
economies of scale and manufacturing used to mean we make as much product as we can, we put it in a warehouse and we wait for it to be sold. Now economies of scale have changed dramatically and they mean we have the capacity to make all the products that people want in real time. Complete change, much more efficient. Can you see this constructal law flowing toward more efficiency? That's the end of the constructal law. So it's taken a different form. It's still economy of skill, but it looks entirely different. Uh, discipline, uh, Bejan describes as physics, math, geometry, etc. And we have to know these disciplines in order to function in the world. Uh, complexity moves toward order. So the smartest people take complexity and, and chaos and they move toward order. Uh, that's what we do in, in manufacturing and teaching, in theory, et cetera. So in manufacturing, we rely on high theorists. We rely, rely on physicists. Uh, he mentioned DOAS, which is the new methodology of making heating and air conditioning was theorized by a Dr. Stanley Muma at Penn State University. And so from that theory, then the practical engineers can pull it apart and say, do we have the resources and the knowledge to make sense out of it? But we have to have that theory to move forward. Freedom is absolutely required. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about American exceptionalism. I sum it up in freedom. So it doesn't matter where you come from, what you look like, uh, if you come to America, you have more freedom and you're more productive. That's what American exceptionalism, it's not very complicated. So individuals are frustrated in their foreign countries come here and they're amazingly successful. Uh, innovation, um, Bajan makes an important point here. There's no human progress without innovation. And you can look back, you know, the uh, 2,000 plus years, you just took it through. And the fact that we're, we're, we're constantly building with new innovation, life gets better, it's more productive, it's more safe, et cetera. And evolution is absolutely necessary. If there's no evolution, um, there's no flow, you're a fossil. So we have walking fossils. Uh, people turn themselves into that fossil. Uh, and I think it's just an amazing concept to understand. So here's a cl quick application to captive air. We want to flow, we want to grow, we're in 1981, we're a whole lot of nothing, we're a million dollar company. How do we flow to be a larger company? Well, in the industry we're in, everybody works through manufacturers reps. So what I decided to do was to hire our own sales team so they could take the message out and we would have greater flow. It's a, it's a good example of the constructive law. In, as we began that flow over the next 20 years, we needed more manufacturing capacity, we decentralized. Uh, when we opened our first plant in Oklahoma, one of our sales engineers called me and said, I don't think you're very smart. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, anybody would know, this is, this is what you're gonna, anybody would know that you could expand your plant, it would be less costly, and it would be more efficient. I said, well, that's not, that's not the way we see it. So it turned out, now we have uh, seven decentralized uh, manufacturing plants uh, spread around the country. So flow is also getting the product from the plant to the job site. That takes transportation. Everybody knows we've had terrible transportation problems in recent time. So you have to look at problems in a different light than the current convention. And if you don't, then you're just with the convention and you're what Peter Thiel calls, you're competing against everybody in the world. Whereas if you innovate, you're moving vertical uh, you don't have competition, at least for a period of time. Uh, we also uh, brought in service teams around the country because we found out that people couldn't uh, really service our equipment in the way we, in the time frames of the cost that we wanted. And we began to innovate as many new technologies as we can. Again, this is going vertical, bring new technologies into the market. And some of our team gets a little aggravated with this because we're constantly saying, that's a 10 year old technology we've declared to be legacy, it's gonna die. We're gonna put, we're gonna make it die. The, um, um, the high tech industry does that. They literally say, this product dies on this date. <laughs> okay, it's obsolete. Uh, so engineering involves uh, through freedom. 
1984, we were introduced to a computerized hydraulic press brake. It was invented in uh, the Netherlands. I had dreamed about something like this for about seven years prior to that. So when I saw it, we bought it instantaneously. Uh, so sometimes we have to have thoughts that, that we can't make work right now. We have thoughts and aspirations for the future. But it allows us to make better decisions at that time. Uh, in 2004, uh, we figured out how to put hoods on an assembly line, which uh, ha had its own complexities, greater flow, higher quality, very hard to compete with. Uh, we continued integration. Uh, many buildings, particularly in HVAC complicated systems, are not fully integrated, and when not fully integrated, then there's battles on the job site. How do you make all this work? When a job is fully engineered and master integrated, the good mechanics, electricians, they can put that erector set together in real time and it's going to work perfectly. So integration is flow and it's very, very important to construction and manufacturing. If we look at um, modern day HVAC, kind of a brief history, in a 50 year period, we didn't see any real improvements in HVAC. Arguably, we didn't see any real improvements essentially in 100 years. Uh, since uh, Carrier came up with the idea of HVAC. But there was an um, individual, Dr. Bill Code in St. Louis, and he said, hey, we're 100 years down line. We're not achieving the goals that I had in my mind as when I went to engineering school. And he started to define what those were. And, he, and Dr. Muma from Penn State heard him and said, I'm putting my team to work on this. So here we have two engineers outside the system who are making observations and they're saying, we're gonna create a new path of flow that's gonna be more efficient. So these new dedicated outside air systems are highly efficient and they're moving into the market now and the market is accepting them at such a rapid pace uh, that the traditional people, are, they're shocked. They shouldn't be shocked if they went to this presentation tonight. Uh, it's pretty, and, and here's one of the things that, and I think this is really good for young people, that Bejan makes his points, it's absolutely predictable what's gonna happen. Now, we can have two DOES manufacturers and one's more efficient, it's predictable they're probably gonna win the war, okay? So the idea that your career can be predictable is important. We all want predictability at what we're doing. I think it's one of the key things that I've learned from Adrian Bijan. So Thale, what is Thales College? It's new, it's new flow moving toward more efficiency. So if we begin, what is a college? Okay, when I went to college, I was a, commu a, commu a commuter, and we went there to learn, and we went home and we did work or whatever we did. Uh, that, was the, that was college. They had other things going on. They had basketball, and they had what it, dances, and we didn't do any of those things. We just went to college, we learned, because that's why we went to college. All male at that time, probably a thousand male students. That's what they all did, probably in the 90 percentile. Now, you could say if you have a football team, that's nice, it's fun on the weekends, but it really has nothing to do with college uh, as we know it. So, what is college? It's developing your character, de developing your skills, learning from professors, uh, meeting new colleagues that actually can help you learn. So, the idea of where I went to college was you're going to be a professional person. You dress like a professional, you come on time. Not very complicated, right? Add in internships so you can be exposed to people who have good experience and can move you along faster in life. Greater flow? Absolutely. Now, resistance. Bejan says resistance uh, will be short-lived. Okay, it will be overcome, and it will be overcome with more power. So resistance is in our family, friends, business associates, organizations. It's every, within industries, there's massive resistance. We changed the type of metal used in the uh, kitchen ventilation business in 1988. 20 years later, the entire food service industry made the change. But what did they do for the first 15 years? They disparaged us. It's resistance. Our power overcame that resistance, and therefore we became the largest producer in that field. So resistance will always be there, and you have to make it a judgment. 
does this resistance make sense? These people are giving me uh, uh, some wisdom. Or does it not make sense because my idea is so innovative, they don't understand it, I have to move past the resistance. Um, within industries, the resistance is absolutely enormous. Whether, whether it's colleges or it's HVAC industry or whatever it is, any change will have high resistance. Bejan says power overcomes resistance. Now think about this. If there's so many children in getting out of the third grade in North Carolina that they passed a law that says you can't get out of third grade unless you can read, but it's still happening, even with a law in place. So if we look at this case here where we have freedom, okay, we don't have noise, and, you know, the door, door's closed, there's no outside noise, if students are disruptive, they're asked to leave the room. So now we have an environment where they can learn the students are motivated to learn because young students want to learn, they want to improve, they want to flow, they want to be more efficient. And we have a teacher that has a curriculum program that teaches them how to read. So what are these students doing? They're flowing toward more efficiency, becoming better readers, better students, basic constructo law, as clear as a bell. Now, why wouldn't that be adopted worldwide? Resistance, okay? There's going to be resistance to flow in all cases. We have to remember that. Resistance in some cases could be valid. In many cases, it's not valid. Going back to what you said earlier, when they were trying to decide how to go over the mountain with the railroads, first they looked and say, how did the water flow? <laughs> okay, so they used basic physics even if they weren't thinking about physics. But if we understand these laws of physics, We'll be better decision makers, and we'll be more productive. If you look at these students, they're completely free, okay? They're happy because they're free. They're, they're kind of doing their own thing in this case. Um, if you think of having a mask, is that not resistance? It's hard to communicate. Accreditation is kind of an old idea. Uh, we did a seminar on it. It's resistance to change. It's resistance to innovation. Teacher licensing, it all sounds good on the surface, uh, but some of the best teachers we've ever had uh, did not have a teacher's license, okay? Because they, they were physicists, they were mathematicians, they were any, any number of teachers, and you're saying you can't teach, it's all nonsense. So students are free to learn, and they have individuals who have capabilities that create flow within those students, and we get great outcomes. Again, it's not complicated, okay? This is not, <laughs> this is not rocket science. Um, but we're, we're freed up because if we understand the constructor law, we know we have to be free to flow. We also know we will get resistance, and we will make mistakes, and then we'll continue to flow. Not complicated. If you understand that, then that's, that's the course of your life. That's why God created you. If you think about innovation, the fact that you can, in most cases, city water, you can drink it, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. This, this whole flow system, and you can actually drink the water, it's amazing. Uh, we take electricity for granted, iPhones. Somehow we, we survived in the 50s and 60s with no iPhones. I'm not sure how we did it, but... Uh, <laughs> Now we have a superior communication, and we're more productive, okay? We can flow in, at a greater capacity than we did. So we say we're busier than ever, but we're flowing at very high levels relative to the 1950s. Uh, ditto with air travel. Uh, discipline, uh, we use this example. So in, in the modern world, people think anybody that came before us was not as smart as we are. Oh, that's our message. Uh, but if we look back historically and we'd say, well, wait a minute, how did these Greek uh, mathematicians figure out how high a pyramid was since they weren't very smart? Do you think we would know how to do it in real time? I think we'd be challenged. So that's the reason that we use the classic curriculum. These individuals built buildings that lasted 2,000 years. How old are the pyramids? They're 4,500 years old. They're still there. How old are the Roman buildings? 2,000 years old, they're still there. We tear buildings down in 20 years. Maybe, maybe they were pretty smart, right? 
Oh, by the way, their buildings look beautiful. So <laughs> they look incredibly beautiful. So much so, if you wanted to be an architect, I would say just go spend two years in Rome, make observations, <laughs> make, make sketches. That's all you need to know. You'd need to know some engineering and physics. Uh, <laughs> You could come to Thales College and they'd, they'd prep you on that. Um, again, flow is, at Thales Academy, moving toward outcomes. What a concept. We're in school moving toward actual outcomes instead of just going through the dancing and getting out of school. From the trivium, from Saxon math, from direct instruction, these are all um, curriculum that allow flow to be greater. Put, put that simple. Okay, they're well thought out curriculum that allow flow to be really good. So by the time you're in the fifth grade, you're a great reader. Uh, time you're in the eighth grade, you can debate and you have a school in logic. Time you get out of high school, uh, for many people, you've got better than the college education because you've gotten 2,000 years of, of good information. That concludes our presentation. I hope you can see that. Trying to understand the laws of physics to the best of your ability will make you a very superior decision maker and might uh, allow you to think differently about things. So I think we have time for questions. Oh, you want to come up? Yeah. I mean, it's like with any new undertaking, um, th there always are some valid reasons because there's a risk to doing something new. So someone who understands what we're currently doing might resist because they know there's a risk involved and they don't think it's worth that risk. So innovation require, it, it, it is risk, basically. And for most people, they don't want to take any risk. Uh, they want to get their card punched, they want to get their credential and then figure, I've got it. And the world we live in is entirely different uh, because we're living in the world of the unknown. Uh, that's the jobs we do on. So some people can thrive in that world of the unknown. Most people can't. Um, so, so resistance can be beneficial, but it can also just stop innovation cold. Uh, I, I reviewed, uh, when we made this change to 430 Metal, I went all the way back and said, I know that most everybody in the company was opposed to it. I had three engineers at work with me, and I went back to them and said, were you for me, against me, or neutral? And they said, we were neutral because we just didn't know either way. We were just supporting what you were doing. Well, that was a case where I'm going against resistance. It, at least in my little mind, I'm sure this is the right answer. I could have been wrong. In this case, I wasn't wrong. So sometimes if you're going to take a big risk, you better hope you're really right, and maybe you would have wished you listened to that resistance. That's judgment, and judgment's always subject to being wrong. So just to, to piggyback on that, so my understanding, my simplistic understanding of uh, the constructive law, uh, the risk comes that if you do a new branch, it might be less efficient than staying on the main branch. Right. I mean, that's, you know, so, so, so then resources are wasted, the water going over here, and it dries up because that ended up being a less efficient branch. I mean, that's why there's resistance. But it could be that you push through that sediment, and actually then that's the more, then that becomes the more resistant uh, flow in that direction. You want to come in yeah, just, I mean, the lightning wasted electrical potential. <laughs> it's looking. And eventually Seeking. one. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of, a lot of branches that died off. Maybe it's like more of a God-related question, but I'm just curious when we looked at the line, we picture the line and flow, and how systems want to go towards more flow. Why doesn't any animal system continue to evolve to more flow? Where I realize you can have like collateral circulation, like an event of injury, 
but like with a lung, like why does it essentially stay in that form for you know millions of years? The lung doesn't really change. Yeah. So this, so then you you have to get into all kind of different th so. Animals, there's a gradation of animals. So one of the things that Bijan will also point out too is that bigger animals have bigger flow systems, right? So whales have these huge systems biologically um, inside of us, and they can facilitate more flow. Um, and there's also kind of an argument about, it's similar to the economy of scales, that bigger animals generally live longer, survive. Um, for him, it's the survival is more like surviving in time. It's not necessarily uh, animals eating each other, although that does play into an effect. Um, I, I think you could probably extend it out and maybe say that um, what really flows is the information, right? You can kind of get an information theory, talk about the biochemistry. The brain is also a very branch system. This is why like advances in machine learning with neural networks, there's all these little branch diagrams that you have. And that it's possible that it's through that, rather than through the lung, it's the brain flow that then makes us do science and technology and we're actually extracting resources. So if, you, if we really wanted to bring in physics, we would talk about free energy gradients. And we actually consume more energy than animals do because of our technology. We um, use, use uh, currently we use fossil fuels. There may be other, other methods, but we're actually consuming energy faster than that animal is. And so there's, there's different ways to look at what is ultimately flowing, but it's, it's energy. So. Studies have shown that it's, it's more difficult to retain information uh, when you're reading on a screen than in an actual book. Yet, reading on a screen is more efficient if, if you're trying to read something, <coughs> gaining access to that information is much more efficient on the internet, and yet your retention of the material is less efficient than if you're reading a book. So how do you strike a good balance between efficiency and the best way to do something, which sometimes isn't the most efficient. Here's what I do. If I'm reading on the screen, I highlight everything uh, that I think is high value to me. And then that forms my notes, which I, I can just look up anytime I want. So I find it to be very efficient if I highlight. If I don't highlight and I want to go back and find it, it doesn't work as well. So if I'm doing a book review, I do all the highlights, and for, on, at least on the iPad, you can print out all those highlights, mm -hmm. the page number, and you print the page number in case you w wanted to read more, you can go back and use it as a reference. So I'm going to say it depends on how you use the tool, at least for me. You might have a comment on that. Yeah. So, Keller, you know, I, I mentioned Plato. Plato famously or notoriously criticizes writing. He's being tongue-in-cheek. One of his characters <laughs> criticizes writing. But the reason why we have all of his works and none of his predecessors is because he wrote them down in an oral culture. Um, I, another example with the modern day, so uh, if you ever read Augustine, Augustine wrote a lot, or there's a lot of what Augustine said. He rambles so much that I have convinced, my, and they're brilliant ramblings, but it's, it's a lot. I have convinced myself that he is dictating. And there's another human being for a lot of these works, not all of them, but several of the works, they're writing it down. And think about, you have to expend the human labor of an entire other individual writing this down. But you can pull out your phone right now and drive home tonight and you can dictate stuff into your phone for 30 minutes and, and get book, you know, chapter length notations. And so there is, there is this interplay. We're actually probably less powerful in ourselves, but it's external to us. We store this stuff externally and it can move faster that way. So that's a way that you can kind of synthesize and the ideas of what we were saying with the same thing said about um, if you take physical handwritten notes, it's better than taking them on your computer. But I take notes on my computer all the time, and I find it to be very effective. If I don't take the notes now, I'm not going to remember all those things. But the fact that I took the notes, I remember them. And I rarely have to refer to those notes. But if I want to, they're there. <laughs> so I think some things might be personal preference style, so a big study doesn't necessarily, when you get down to one person, relate. Because we're different. Um, so the, the case could be entirely different for you and I. <laughs> Does anybody want to make any comments about constructual law, the, the idea of flowing toward efficiency, mm -hmm. and having certain norms like economies of scale, hierarchy? Does that make any sense in your life? Is it? 
you see any applications? Oh, we, we have a professor in the back here. Uh, no, just a, just a teacher. Um, so, Bob, I appreciate your comments tonight. I'm, I'm, uh, I find over the years I've worked for you, there have been times when I've, I've disagreed, and there, usually when I put forth a counter case, you surprise me with how well you respond. So I want to kind of just push back a little bit and see what, how you respond to that. Um, when I first started working for Thales, I was a bit of a technophobe and thoroughly believed that uh, the faster we went, we necessarily sacrifice some kind of quality in the pursuit of speed. Uh, and over the last 10 years, I, I've sort of left behind a reflexive rejection of technology and been forced to appreciate I can get a lot more done with a laptop and an iPad than I can with a notepad and a pen. And those efficiency gains are valuable. Uh, but there's still part of me that thinks, okay, I, I see the value in rushing towards the goal, and the goal is important. And when we operate towards a big goal at scale, we can do a lot more. But there's still part of me that thinks, are we necessarily sacrificing some sort of quality with a focus on efficiency and pushing towards kind of the scalability if we're thinking about how do we move as fast as possible and towards as large of a goal as possible? So. Any pushback you have on that, I'd, I'd be very curious to hear. Well, I would say absolutely yes. So I think we need to have a sep separate concept in there. So it, in when I was in college, or probably maybe after college, there was a linear uh, word processor. It, it was a new product coming out. I didn't have one. I thought, can you imagine if we had one of these in college? This was the most amazing thing of driving out papers and improving papers. So that's one side of the technology. The other side is, let's take with the presentation tonight. You would probably have to listen to this presentation a number of times, think of that a lot, discuss it a lot. So we need to learn certain concepts really well, whether we've learned them cold, we've memorized them, we used them. So we have to be able to do both, is use technology where we gain speed, the word processor, the email, et cetera, but we can't get too enamored with it because then we do race through life and we don't learn it well. And in some cases that may be, we really didn't learn it at all. So I think one of the purposes of this presentation was to try to drive home some important concepts we need to learn well. Can I, before, I just want to give one comment. I view technology as the flow system, but it's your own mind that's the driver. All right, so it can, if you, if you take the time with a student to develop their own sort of mental capabilities, they will be more powerful with the technology than their predecessors. Now, if you don't develop the flow, no, if you have a great flow system and you don't have a force behind it, there's not gonna be any flow coming out. And that's what happens with an individual that, whose soul and their, and their psyche has not been developed well. You can give them all the technology and they can't do anything with it. So you need both, the both are good. Yeah, how about this? I used to carry these books around with me and you get busy and sometimes I didn't read them at all. But now they're all carried with me on that iPad. And I talked to another individual about this. So if you have 10 minutes, you can be reading things that you couldn't do years ago. So that's a really good use of technology. But I would come back to your salient point. We need to drive home the most important things so that they know them cold. And if you go into direct instruction, uh, Schaefer, who was our consultant, would, would make a really important point of that. You need to know these by heart and you need to know how to, to use them. Maybe that uh, uh, touches on my question, which is so two of the values are freedom and discipline. And sometimes it can feel just when you read it that those two things are in conflict or in tension, right? So you might think, uh, you know, at college, a school where you can just take whatever you want, and you can take basket weaving over here, and you can take right around, you know, a little bit of physics, that's freedom, right? Or freedom is you can come to college and you can wear whatever you want, or, you know, et cetera, right? Freedom needs restrictions. Right. But, but then there's a discipline side. So how, like, how do those two interact? I mean, if more freedom means more flow, that's supposed to be always better. So then how do you bring the, the discipline aspect into that? How do you know when you need more discipline versus more freedom? I think it's the freedom to flow, but for example, what we do, if you went back 30 years in kitchen ventilation, everybody has all these ideas, and I said, okay, it's great to have these ideas. Most of them are no good. Here's how we're gonna sort it out. Every idea has to be tested. That's the discipline. So we'll, we'll test your idea. We think it's feasible. Most of them are gonna fail. Um, that, that, that would be my explanation. Well, and, and if, like, 
your example, the pipe problem, right? Let's say um, the water is a freedom and it goes through the pipe. The pipe is discipline. If you have no pipe, the water just goes everywhere. You need that pipe to channel it towards a, like a directed goal. That's a good example. Very good example. So, so the classics, right? The wisdom of 2,000 years. We're not going to just teach every newfangled thing. We're going we're gonna to stick to what we know works. That's like tried and true pipes or whatever, right? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna use stuff that we know is efficient and works. Yeah, Edward Land, the creator of the Polaroid camera, said that innovation begins at the edge of the known. And he's implying, first of all, we have to know things, and we have to know everything possible, and then we move toward innovation. Whereas people think, I'm a free thinker, I'm a free spirit. You're not going to create anything. There may be an occasional genius, but for the most part, not. To uh, for Benjamin, the member of audience point, so if I had one of these, right, and I had the freedom to make this, I think the lack of discipline would be if I poked holes <laughs> in all of this. Um, and the, the soul that is undisciplined is a leaky jar. This is an analogy from another Platonic dialogue, and it spills out. Right? You want to branch out, but you want it all to go that way. You don't want it to be leaking. And that's, yeah. You get it. I'm trying to form how to, how to ask this question, but all, all, a lot of these analogies that we've seen in nature that directly reflect in and, and human interaction kind of doesn't address the fact that nature is not human. And so there's a lot more variables that take place between our ears that don't take place when a river basin is being created. So how do we account for making decisions when we're the only person trying to, I mean, like, I guess Captain Fear is a really good example that Bob had an idea, but he meant, he meant resistance along the way. But how do you know, do you know something is effective until when it happens, or do you know something's going to be effective? Does that make sense? Did you know that these things were going to work out, or was it kind of something you figured out as you went? Well, Adrian would say you have a hunch. Yeah. Uh, but you have to prove that hunch. So ideally, you try to prove it before you go on, on live stage uh, with your play. Kind of reminds me of the lightning striking. Right? Yeah. Like you're kind of striking, but then eventually shoot that big bolt when you feel like it's the right time. Mm -hmm. I think the failure rate for new businesses is something like in the 90-something percent. So you're seeing the success, right? You're seeing that final strike, but to Kelly's point, you know, they, there's a lot of branches off that don't succeed because they either weren't efficient or sometimes this question about when to branch off, some people go for those hunches and they just don't work out. And it's not even their fault. It was wise at the time, but fortune was cruel. Um, but, and this is kind of, there may be a rationality to this invisible hand. Things work themselves out in ways that we can't see because of the system um, rewarding. Can I add to this? So yeah. if you're gonna start a small business, they'll say, well, you have to be properly capitalized and you have to have a business plan and ditto, ditto. I didn't do any of that stuff. <laughs> so my concept is, because I didn't have any money and I didn't have time for a business plan, I, I wouldn't do one anyhow, but um, that ideas trump these conventions. Th these are just, general conventions thrown out there. That's why we have brains, okay? Here's where I'm at. So we work from where we're at to where we're trying to get to. And if you get stuck on all these conventions, I gotta, I gotta check all these things off, then maybe you never get out of the gate. What would you say, the, the innovation is, what did you say on the cusp of the unknown? The, the, the edge of the known. On the edge of the known. Mm -hmm. So in this instance, wouldn't the known be those conventions? and then you're branching off of those? Or what exactly is the known in this instance if you decided? Well, then there's a secondary. I don't have any of those things available to me. Right. So what am I going to not go? So I have two days to make this decision. And I said, I'm going to go. I, I'm, I don't care about all those things. So they're not going to matter in the long run. Pretty high risk. Um, but, so what but it's judgment. Right. And that's your discipline that's, that's allowing that freedom, is, is using your judgment in that given circumstance. And I also knew, and I knew this in maybe the first five years, you've got to be really intense because you've taken this huge risk. You have to make it work. And the odds of it working are very low. So I think it brought more intensity than you would have if someone says, you know, here's $10 million, Philip, see what you can do with it. He says, well, I've got to hire staff and I, I need to build a building. And, and, and we're seeing evidence in the market right now and they're all failing because they're not grounded in reality. I'll give you one last thing. This is convention. So you have a business plan and you say, 
Captivir is going to triple in size. And then you, you bring in these consultants, and they say, oh, we have software to tell you how to do that. You need to hire 2,000 employees. You need to have this many square feet. You need to buy this much equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, Pel Peloton did this. So they hire 2,500 employees that they don't need, and they're never going to need. Uh, <laughs> see what happens? There's no judgment here. They're, they're just going right down this conventional path that consultants are feeding them. And consultants, are, they know what's in the past. They don't know what's in the future. So we're, we're trying to develop minds that saying, I'm moving to the future. It's unknown and unknowable in many ways. And I, I got to be able to work through that. And the human brain has that capability, but it has to be highly developed in every, in every fashion that you can think of. And you've, you've brought up a lot of them tonight. Uh, but if, if you went to a session like this every month, OK, for five years, and then you thought about it and you studied about it, you would be a vastly superior person to your peers. That's a proven fact. I think that's an excellent point to end on. So we can continue the discussion of refreshments, but Thank you, Mr. Letty. Thank you for having me.